simplify it and use a complicated mechanism to explain it, right? That's how you kind of simplify it. So when we see resilience, right, when we talk about smart cities and so on, it is a system, right? There are multiple things that are playing together. We do a lot of urban mobility systems for smart cities globally. If you talk about Singapore, Berlin and so on, Bosch plays a big role there. It works because it's a very simple concept. Any part of the system, when it goes wrong, right? So that is when the drop starts happening. And then you realize it is going down and you have to take some time to react to it and then you have to bring it back up. And till you do that, every other interconnected system is gonna go for a toss literally. So if you have a train that is gonna come in and you have a bus system that connects to that, any delay in the train system, we can all imagine, will get the whole bus network out of place. So one of the core aspects of resilience is to reduce the width and height of this, obviously. And the way to do that is to improve the accuracy. So the accuracy at the edge for every device, every system that is out there should be extremely high. So that's kind of how we view it. So the more smarter, the more resilient a city becomes, every device at the edge and every interface has to become extremely accurate. And that is where we see a big role for companies like us and all innovators out there because you need technologies that actually brings in that accuracy. So now I'll make my points. First example, so this is something I think was already mentioned. We've been working with uh, Rockefeller Foundation uh, here in terms of actually demonstrating uh, this. So if you see how malaria detection is done, so when there's a climate change, we know malaria is a huge problem, Africa, India, uh, everywhere. There are a lot of issues in terms of uh, how exactly it is done. So some guys want to sit, look at fields of view. So if he misses a field of view, even if you have malaria, there's no way to catch it. So that's kind of the reality of the situation uh, today. So a lot of false positives and false negatives. So low accuracies. The results actually change based on storage. How you store it actually matters to the results. So you may not have malaria because it was stored badly. You actually end up you know, showing some kind of positive uh, results. So when we think about a resilient system, as I said, you have to make it extremely accurate. So that is kind of what we are uh, doing it uh, in the field. So first concept is make it accurate, but to do make it accurate, you have to make it accurate to the absolute technology level. So we fundamentally change the way it is done. So don't use chemical based approaches because chemical purity is not guaranteeable. You're getting my point. It's absolutely at the minutest detail. You will not have resilient systems unless you think at that level. So we said the only and most accurate system in the world today is optical. Whether you take aircrafts, which moved from mechanical to fly-by-wire to now fly-by-light, it is optical system. So how do you bring optical systems to detect malaria? So that tomorrow when there is an outbreak of malaria, the city, the village, wherever it is, is resilient because you can detect it accurately. You can detect it earlier because optical systems will enable you to detect it much earlier than later, uh, if you will and it will actually hit accuracies at the gold standard. So that's kind of how we think about resilient systems and how they fit into the overall concept so that when the interface works, it is an accurate data that is kind of passing these interfaces. So that's fundamentally what pervades our thinking. So quickly, a couple of picture charts. So when we uh, look at food adulteration, there's a big issue of adulteration of food. In India, huge uh, health issues that pervades across cities, across uh, the country. Again, how do you detect adulteration, for example, in this case in milk? Not by getting stuck on what exactly is out there, but accurately detect how much is getting adulterated and how differently. So fundamentally change the technology when you detect that. Similarly, in other healthcare areas, for example, if you want to do a massive health camp in terms of detecting breakout of eye medical conditions, right? So there's a huge issue today. The biggest bottleneck we found was that you have to dilate the eyes. So that is the fundamental thing to make a resilient system is to remove eye drop usage for the eye because that is when you can screen massive amounts of population in a very rapid pace. And that's how you build, uh, as we said, about 10 times. So the other aspect is mobility. So if you see a community water system, you need, almost need a 30 by 40 site. Land acquisition is a huge issue in India. People talked about resilience and how we need to make it mobile. So we said this is one of the biggest bottlenecks. So you can focus on a technology, but how do you cut it down to a system which can actually move as a city gets smarter? So that's kind of how we think about it. And that's the angle in which I will approach this discussion.
wonderful. Thank you, Ashan. Um, so a lot of you know, this, this idea of a lot of sort of product innovation that when we think about you know a smart city, one that is able to res be responsive. What you're doing is sort of building the capacity or enabling people to act quicker, detect quicker, solve problems in a way, be decoupled from the challenges of the larger governance questions that a city might be struggling with, whether it's in terms of provision of safe water or relying on the the, the health department necessarily to be aware of when a particular disease outbreak is happening. So you get a much more responsive system. And that's just in the health sector. It could be applied in other domains. Um, so Manoj, I'm going to uh, last but by no means least turn to you and, and, and the work that you're doing. Um, you know, when we talk of smart cities, we often tend to think of smart infrastructure or physical infrastructure or technologies. But um, how does the question of financial inclusion um, for communities within cities, how does that fit into the picture in your mind based on the work that uh, Arohan is doing on microinsurance and, and making citizens in cities more, more resilient to shocks and disasters, et cetera? No, thank you, Ashwin. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, we'll just say a few lines about Arohan first. So we are basically what is called as an NBFC MFI uh, operating out of West Bengal. Uh, we cover five states today, West Bengal, Bihar, Assam, Jharkhand, and Odisha. Uh, the number of customers that we cover is about 3,30,000 customers across these five states. And happy to uh, let you know that apart from uh, credit, which is really the primary business, we have also started pilots in terms of pensions and insurance. So uh, the whole idea is to actually become a financial inclusion player and actually uh, make available all the products and services which actually a customer at the, I mean, at the center of the business can actually uh, look forward to. Uh, we also happen to be an IntelliCab group company. Uh, this is the retail lending business of the, of the group. Uh, so the way financial inclusion is actually defined by the RBI Ashwin uh, is that uh, the, the, the customer should have access to sort of a bank account so that savings can be mobilized. Uh, he or she should have access to the credit facility through the formal uh, financial system and also have access to risk management products, which is really insurance and pensions, and also have access to fund transfer kind of opportunities in terms of the money uh, um, that needs to be transferred. So the way RBI uh, sort of defines financial inclusion is for the customer to have access to these, um, to these products and services. Uh, what you see there on the video, some of the customers that we deal with, uh, the type of customers, the kind of products that we offer, uh, with the USP being a complete doorstep service and the fact that we offer micro loans which sort of start with 10,000 rupees, uh, you know, to the customers that you see there on the screen. So uh, if you take a perspective of the country, uh, as you know, 1.2 billion population, uh, uh, majority of that being in the rural and the semi-urban kind of areas, and I would sort of mention here that even in the urban areas that we are talking about, the, the, the issues regarding financial inclusion remain the same. So the maid who works for you, the driver who actually drives for you, still have an issue in terms of accessing the kind of financial inclusion products that you or me have. Uh, so if you look at India as I mean in totality, uh, I'm told with the kind of efforts that the government has taken in the last two, three years, we've reached a level where uh, we claim today 58% of our uh, I mean, I mean, uh, population actually have access to a bank account. This is really the first step in terms of being financially inclu I mean, included. But in terms of credit, uh, the number which was about 4% earlier has gradually moved to a I mean, sort of double digit number to about 10, 11%. So what this essentially means is that in terms of credit, less than 10% uh, of people have actually have access to a formal credit institution. It is still friends and relatives, it is still your neighborhood money lender who actually helps you I mean, in terms of emergency and crisis. Except people like you and me, I mean, which have banks uh, sort of chasing us with loans. Uh, so the microfinance industry today uh, is, is proud to cover about 35 million clients uh, with a portfolio outstanding of about 35,000 crores. And gradually what you see there is the transition from being a simple loan provider to actually being a financial inclusion uh, arm and service provider. And this has been enabled through sort of various uh, uh, sort of regulations that the RBI has come out with and the opening up of the sector. So today all of us actually can become full service uh, banking correspondents. 
which means even if we cannot take savings and open accounts for a customer because we are still an NBFC and not a bank, but we can actually provide that by being agent of a different bank. And uh, with that, with that focus in mind, uh, all the six, seven uh, sort of services that the customer requires, which is uh, we define it as uh, being available to sort of open a bank account, uh, being able to mobilize savings, being able to get a credit line from the kind of credibility that you've built with the organization, insurance products, pension products, uh, building up your savings in terms of the account that you open, and also having access to remittances. So I would say, uh, uh, I mean, when we talk about smart cities, we talk about the architecture, we talk about the connectivity that my, I mean, that my colleagues have spoken here, but all of them uh, would actually need a force multiplier in terms of access to finance. So whether it is finance at the institutional level for these sort of developments to happen, or for finance at the BOP level in terms of people who would actually work and live in those cities. Uh, and I think the enabling uh, environment has actually been created by the PMJDY, which has opened about 14 million bank accounts in, um, in about three, four months. And we claim that there are about 14,000 crores which has been mobilized in those accounts. So unlike uh, the typical zero balance accounts that people have spoken about and being dormant, Today, at least, the architecture has been set in terms of accounts being opened, and hopefully over a period of time, they would be far more active than what they are today. Uh, the UID is, again, a, I mean, a game changer. So at least today, uh, with the UID getting sort of increasingly penetrated, uh, you're able to link that to sort of the credit history of the customer and ensure that people who've got great, I mean, good credit record uh, would actually have access to a better loan uh, you know, than somebody who's actually taken a loan and defaulted. Uh, Mudra, which has just been launched about two days back by the PM in the same building on the ground floor, again promises to be a paradigm shift in terms of being a game changer and uh, it, it seeks to create funding opportunities for the kind of organizations today which deal with the BOP. So microfinance institutions, NBFCs, the smaller cooperative banks, all of them would have access to refinance facilities, which would mean that uh, the type of business that we do today and the kind of outreach that we have today would probably be multiplied, uh, I mean, I would say manifold in terms of actually reaching that number that we need to reach. So uh, financial inclusion and access to finance is really where we come in in terms of the smart city projects that we talk about. Thank you. Um, so, Jagan, I'm gonna throw a question back to you. What we've heard here is, you know, there's this, there's this theme of, there's a, there's a lot of innovation taking place. There are a lot of new, um, products, new services, new capacities that can be deployed in cities. Not all of this is going to be dependent on the design of a city, of a smart city, but rather the creation of an environment in which different types of solutions can actually be harnessed and supported. So to what extent is engaging with the private sector where a lot of this innovation is going to come from, whether it's social entrepreneurs or whether it's larger companies like Cisco, um, to what extent is that being thought about as part of building the enabling environment? I mean, we hear a lot about designing a smart city, but it seems to me what we're hearing is we need to create conditions for a city to become smart. How is that playing out in the, in the ministry in terms of the thinking there? Um, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, I think, um, <clears throat> I think when, I, when I say design, um, we need to uh, underline the fact that the smart city planning that is being uh, promoted and supported uh, through the mission is an integrated planning. It's, uh, it, it's not that you're planning only for real estate. Uh, you're actually planning your mobility, your, inter your uh, communications networks, uh, as well as your entire e-governance framework, which is actually one of the backbones of the smart cities program. Interestingly here, you know, these, these are aspects which probably haven't been told and I think the concept note probably doesn't spell it out enough, uh, is that we are, we are assuming that while there is an urban development program being put into, uh, uh, you know, put into motion, um, there are already other uh, initiatives that are also happening. And, uh, and these are game changers in themselves. So Digital India is pushing for connectivity, it is pushing for e-governance uh, as a norm. And so we are also assuming that we are moving towards those kinds of ecosystem issues. Um, I think uh, I want to pick up one of the words that Prashant used uh, several times and I often use myself, which is the game changing. Um, we, we are also assuming that, for instance, the UID is going to be a game changer in terms of 
the ways in which either targeting of uh, government programs is done, especially in cities, um, but also uh, tracking and, and monitoring and evaluation work as well. Um, so UID plus ICT plus data, an ecosystem that is evidence-based, um, is being promoted and pushed and uh, in some cases, in some aspects, being made mandatory that you're actually uh, basing your, your, your management of the city um, and, and this, this entire paradigm of, of inclusion within uh, a transparent and accountable and, and, and I think a word that, um, that you used, uh, Harsha, accuracy, um, although in a slightly different manner, I'm just picking up the word, but accuracy really will matter uh, a lot. So um, I think um, overall it's, it's a mission that, that um, works towards the creation of resilience in the economies of cities and to see cities as, um, as active political economies with a very strong civic ethos in them. You know, so again, the big difference between cities and non-cities uh, is the character of the civic. And, and that's a very different kind of ball game. It's not exactly uh, the same as, uh, you know, the, you can't exactly be uh, talking about inclusion in a kind of paternalistic way. It, it needs to be inclusion which recognizes rights and recognizing, uh, recognizes the dignity of the individual that actually participates in the building of cities. And I think, um, again, that sounds like you know, overly romantic maybe, one, <laughs> one could say. Um, but these are uh, some of the uh, key ideas that have informed uh, the design of the mission. And we know for, for a fact that um, the Urban Development Ministry alone does not decide the destiny of cities in India. So um, it will depend a lot on how the overall governance structure actually begins to bring people to the table and uh, promote convergence of interests. Um, Patrick, I want to ask you a question and then I'm going <coughs> to see if there's comments or questions. I, I don't know. I don't think we have too much time left um, because we started a bit late. Um, you're based in Bangalore. Um, Bangalore probably has the largest concentration of smart companies um, in the country, yet it doesn't seem to add up to a smart city from what we were discussing earlier. So tell us a little bit about the interface with the public sector. I mean, a lot of this does rely on having some element of a, of a coordinated strategy and vision. Um, how are you, how, how, where is it working as you seek to you know, build capabilities, as you seek to deploy technologies that can really transform, whether it's the governance or management of cities or whatever aspect it is you're trying to address. Well, tell, you know, how, how is it panning out? Because one of the concerns that I often hear talking to smaller cities with presumably less capacity than Bangalore is they, they're not yet sufficiently equipped um, to actually know how to draw in these capacities and integrate them and use them, not just from a affordability, but even just from a basic application. What's your experience, what's Cisco's experience been? And what hope do you have for Bangalore? Well, that's a very profound and a very comprehensive <laughs> question to yeah. answer. I'll respond to the best of my abilities. If there's anybody from Bangalore, I want to apologize before because some of my comments are going to be scathing. Okay. I know Harsha. <laughs> so there are two commentaries we hear every so often wherever there is ICT involved, of ICT being this elitist thing and the difference between India and Bharat. And it's very often not rural and urban divide. It's the affordability indices. So what we are increasingly finding is that affordability of technology and specifically ICT related products are on the decline and decline significantly. Uh, just to give you a context, most of you I'm sure carry USB sticks to store data. Uh, in the year 1950, an eight gig stick used to cost $10 million. Today it costs less than a dollar. And chances are that it will progressively come down and it will never come to zero, but it will always come down. At least in Bangalore, the premise of affording technology has been broken. So the notion that everybody needs to get onto the technology bandwagon is understood. And the conflict very often is not the primary conflict of saying, is it going to help the larger notions of Bharat and is it going to help India? Relative to what we are finding is that technology now becomes a, almost like a transparency catalyst. So let's take microfinance as an industry. If you did not have platforming solutions, the ability to identify assert and deliver the financing option or a complexity of products to the end user would be almost impossible. That is understood. However, what does Bangalore poorly? What Bangalore does poorly is that the level of interface between private capital into smart city development is near zero. 
there are there are a bunch of absolutely engaged citizens who actually do a lot, but relative to the enormity of the problem, it's zero. There's also very interesting statistics wherein we're finding that urban coexistence now has an indifference curve relative to the overall compensation that individual makes. So if an individual makes more than 20 lakhs compensation a year, he becomes indifferent and almost has a sense of entitlement. The city ought to do this for me. It ought to give me free water. It ought to give me portable roads and whatever. And we find that this indifference stays almost till about the 50, 70 lakh compensation barrier. And hopefully then you're a high net worth individual as Prashant is, and then you kind of get involved back into the city. <laughs> so that's the narrative that we are interestingly finding in Bangalore with bigger, bigger aspirations coming <coughs> in. So between the large middle, sec middle class, there is a, some sense of indifference into the city. The third issue that we are very, very, very concerned about is this whole notion of I'm okay, everything's okay, and that, that issue. And fourthly, we find, and it's interesting to hear Jagan's comment, that everybody believes that running a smart city is Ministry of Urban Development's problem. Or running a smart city has been outsourced to somebody who will do a grand plan, and I will come as the Lord and Master and occupy the city, and because I accrue to myself a little bit of compensation, I pay my taxes, I ought to get this service. That apathy has to go. It cannot, of course, come as a top-down commentary from the government to say that thou shall do this and thou shall not do that. That's undemocratic. But we are seeing this apathy in bigger and bigger drops. So let me just end my comments. It's not all bad news, though. Bangalore as a city was defined for four, I mean, was designed for roughly four to five million people. It now has 12 million people. The biggest issue that Bangalore's faced with is that there is no water source near Bangalore. The nearest water availability is 350 kilometers away. And as you have to pipe water into the city for 350 kilometers, it becomes a large subsistence issue that the city is faced with. So the classical notion that the city is suffering because of the lack of capital is true for the government coffers, but it's not true for larger access to capital. I think it's some degree of mismanagement and public apathy. I didn't mean to pick on Bangalore, but since two of our panelists were on, on the, uh, and it's the obvious question we often hear about a, a company, a city that does have such a high concentration of technology firms. Um, so we've had a broad sweep of, of, of views on, you know, wh what are we talking about when we talk about a smart city? What are the challenges? How do we really think about this, both in terms of, the, yes, there is a business opportunity, but there is also a very particular context here in India that we're dealing with. Um, this is not about every city in India becoming like Singapore. Um, and the notion of a smart city uh, in this context is really going to have to be something that we build in a very uh, relevant way to the reality of the fact that in, in, the, in cities in India we have huge disparities, we have huge inequities, we have massive challenges around scarcity and the management of resources. Um, so smart has to be about getting better at solving some of the current problems that we face in urban India and, and a massive opportunity for innovation and private sector uh, to be coming in and integrating um, and, and, and driving some of the solutions. Um, I just um, want to check if there's some comments and questions. So we have two hands up there. We're going to take a round of maybe three or four questions. Um, and, and if you can keep, please keep it brief. If it's directed specifically to someone, then say so. And if not, I'll invite the panel to uh, decide who wants to pick up what question. But why don't we start there with the two hands that side? Yes, ma'am. Can I speak to that? Yeah. Great. Uh, my name is Gauri Sareen, and um, um, I've actually uh, built a platform in a relatively new city called Gurgaon, um, uh, called the Gurgaon Action Plan. The whole idea of this platform is to see how citizens can engage with government to ensure solutions, uh, which are smart solutions and solutions which help build capacity for the government. My own learning in this whole process has been, and this is actually directed at Mr. Jagan, Sure, is that um, um, there isn't enough learning from other cities. There's no, there's no platform today where everything is being reinvented at a city level constantly, even for younger cities. Okay? So what can we do to you know, ensure that there is learning constantly going on? Because I think the kind of ecosystem you're talking about in smart cities is, a, is an ever, um, you know, uh, ever empowering, you know, it's, a, it's a constant, it's a continual dynamic kind of a system. That's one. Two is what is the thought process which has gone, and I'm increasingly concerned about this in a, in a city like Gurgaon, which is expanding from all sides, and this is true for several other cities in India, is, is the concept of smart cities about smaller cities rather than ever increasing and growing cities outside the boundaries? Because smallness also means that you can actually create a 
controllable ecosystem, you know, rather than a you know, system which goes out of control because of the size and stuff. Third and very important, which we've noticed while working with the government, and really it's the most challenging problem, is about people. Uh, you know, people and governance structures, you somewhere mentioned governance structures. This, this doesn't seem to be working in India at all. There's so much of a tussle at the local government level on whether the ULB is going to work as per 74th Amendment versus the, you know, the current power structure which exists. So there's going to be a huge amount of really thinking on how to decentralize and yet make it work. At the same time, there is no capacity for the government to actually uh, deliver what we are really demanding. Right? So there's really no clear thinking going on on capacity building from what I can observe as of now. So and decision making is bound to suffer because of that. So just some comments on this and I thought from my real experience that it could help us. Thank you. Uh, let, let's take the question from the gentleman behind um, and then we'll see if we can cluster a few questions and then you ma'am. Uh, thank you very much for the session. Uh, I do a lot of work in urban sanitation, low cost housing, uh, public health in, um, in, in cities. And really my focus is, you know, how do we make cities livable, um, you know, for even not just the poor, but even for the middle class, right? And what I mean by that is, today we have a host of technologies that are available, including very, very low cost one, decentralized water treatment, you've got different solar energy, uh, electric vehicles. And yet from a policy perspective and an administrative perspective, you see no support or no effort to get those implemented in a, in a proper fashion, in a planned fashion, which is stuff you can do today, right? You don't need to wait for new tech and so on. And, I, and the MIT engineer and me loves the new technology that was presented today. But I think we have a lot of old tech that can be used and needs to be used. And that touches upon the administrative issue. Uh, we work a lot with municipal commissioners across the state, state of Maharashtra. You deal with the Ministry of Urban Department, the Urban Development. And you see a combination of apathy, busyness, and lack of uh, knowledge, which leads to a potent combination of no action at all. And so, you know, you see messages from the top and no action from below. You're stuck in the middle, uh, unable to do a whole lot. And the third thing is, uh, you know, one, one thought around uh, the costs of all these, and especially when you look at small cities, uh, do you ever worry about, do you ever get to a point where you overburden them with too much infrastructure, expensive in infrastructure that cannot be repaired when it breaks or that, you know, burdens the city and therefore the costs get passed down to, uh, to citizens? Uh, versus really looking at simple stuff that does not break, idiot proof, uh, but really makes a significant improvement in quality of life, even before the smartness starts to step in. So, you know, do we, do we look at the whole range of um, solutions available to us? Thank you very much. You. And data, data and information, without that the planning is terrible. Uh, the kind of plans we see, city sanitation plans, you know, you can't do anything with it. That would be something that smart cities need to address. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's take one more, and then I'm going to direct some of these questions. But ma'am, please. Yeah. Um, as you said, this, the entire concept of smart cities, evolving, resilient inclusion. I think one thing that we also uh, need to build in is around safety. This entire, unfortunately, safety, the game changer is becoming the CCTV cameras, which, uh, which it can't be. But the city as a whole, and its design, and in its systems and its data collection and its monitoring, its governance, how is it becoming a safer place, not just for women, but for everyone. So I think that's a very important aspect that has to be built um, into our entire discussion and discourse around smart cities. They should be safe cities. So yeah. if you can build that into your... Uh, so, Jagad, um, the first set of questions was directed specifically at you. So do you want to respond to those around will cities Will the Smart Cities mission help cities to learn better from each other? Um, is there a sense of smaller being smarter? Um, maybe just pick up a couple okay. of Okay, uh, don't ask me to predict outcomes. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's not possible for us to determine that. But um, just again to, to, to address the questions about uh, at least the thinking behind uh, the mission, certainly capacity constraints are well recognized and, and uh, we agonize a lot about it. And so does uh, you know everybody in the government. I, I actually don't, I'm not a government uh, office officer. Um, but everybody is agonizing about it, the prime minister himself. Uh, at every single presentation uh, made by the Ministry of Urban Development has highlighted the capacity issue. So he said, have you found a solution yet? Uh, right, how are you going to address this? Um, from what, what it looks like in terms of numbers required to actually decently manage uh, and fairly manage a city, um, we probably won't make it um, to those numbers, even if we 
uh, start training armies of uh, city administrators because you, you can't actually do that. You can't train armies uh, to administer cities. It's a fairly complex responsibility. So technology will have to help us. Um, we are, <clears throat> again, to go back to the point about e-governance, um, if you have a, um, a, a fairly clear and transparent uh, management system for a city with maps and responsibilities and so on, and you have a accountable and transparent system by which government itself manages uh, things, that's likely to have a significant impact on this particular situation. So while we are working on training and capacity building uh, exercises, uh, you know, time is not on our side. So uh, we've got to find ways. And that's why ICT is a game changer, because it gives us the opportunity to do some things faster. Um, so we've got to do that. Um, a quick answer to your uh, question about, you know, reinventing the wheel. Well, we as an institute, uh, the National Institute of Urban Affairs has, over its 40-year history, spent a lot of it uh, documenting good practices. And I would welcome your uh, sort of, uh, I mean, do browse our website. It's a, it's a newly revamped website, but there are good practice documentation uh, on it, especially over the JNURM phase, over the last uh, eight, uh, eight years. So uh, we continue to do this, in fact, with the Rockefeller Foundation as well. We are, we are doing some documentation of good practices. Uh, which are towards, uh, directed towards resilience. So uh, there is an, an increasing uh, archive of uh, that kind of documentation where we can learn from other places, global as well as uh, uh, national uh, examples. Um, cities that sprawl, cities that are compact, we're certainly promoting compact cities. In fact, that language is used in the scheme guidelines that we should be looking at uh, cities becoming more compact. Um, we are trying to see if uh, at some point uh, a city in India will actually choose to limit its growth. Uh, that's ideal. There are very few examples, but there are a growing number. Um, the city of Portland in Oregon in the US was the first probably in the world that actually fixed geographical limits to its growth. So you could not change those limits without, I think, without a complete consensus in the city administration. Um, so, you know, definitely pushing for compactness. Um, a, a sort of a concomitant of compactness tends to be high rise. And so, you know, it is a bit of a conflicting kind of uh, problem. But then cities like uh, Barcelona as opposed to Atlanta are, are much more compact and house the same number of people uh, in, in much less uh, area. So high rise is also not necessarily uh, a concomitant. Um, I want to, uh, you know, address uh, the question about um, um, safety. Safety, again, uh, very much part of the, the prescriptive part of the mission itself that, um, in fact, what I mentioned about different kinds of plans actually being integrated in one. So a safety, uh, public safety plan <coughs> has to be part of the overall plan for the city. Um, and uh, point well taken, uh, surveillance cameras don't necessarily prevent crime. They're very, they're very useful in, uh, in uh, yeah, monitoring. and. Uh, handling crime, actually detecting uh, or, or identifying suspects. Um, that's, that's a larger civilizational question. You know, do we want to sit behind uh, barbed wire and boundary walls and, you know, and so on and so forth? What is uh, a way to actually handle sentiment and perception uh, of safety, right? And then how do you handle the actual incidence of crime uh, and so on? So, the, you know, it's going to be quite a important debate going forward in every single city that wants to uh, actually make itself smart. Uh, we hope that the public will actually engage in this because it has to be determined collectively. Uh, you know, that level of perception uh, of threat, of fear, um, it, there's an element of it which is uh, sort of widespread and there's an element of it which is area specific and you know, specific to certain kinds of activities in, uh, in cities. So it is not something that you can for, uh, create a formula for uh, handling it. So we can't, we can't get in. Maybe you can catch yeah, Jagan sure. after the, because I've been given very clear smoke signals from my right about the need to wrap the session up. But I do want to um, at least get answers to the other questions. And maybe, Hasha, I'll turn to you. Um, the question about you know, solutions exist, but um, such as the ones that Bosch is, um, is, is working on, but we don't have a, a, a structure in which there's support 
to implement these solutions. Um, to what extent are you finding cooperation with, um, let's say, local municipalities, or is that is that required for part of uh, for, for the rollout of these technologies, or are we doing this entirely um, separate from what government is trying to achieve in terms of a public health system? So I think there are, there are two parts to it. Uh, obviously, when you go into the field, that kind of an infrastructure or support system does not exist. Right? That's kind of the uh, reality. So the way we look at it is, obviously, we cannot stay back and say, till the infrastructure comes, we will not do anything. So we, in at least healthcare, we break it up into two problems, two areas, if you will. So first is, obviously, the public system tells us what is allowed and what is not allowed in terms of certifications and so on. So we obviously go with that. But when it comes to deployment and so on, our current method is to you know, bet on the private sector and go and establish those infrastructure. So I think that is kind of what uh, we are doing. So when it, I think our biggest bottleneck today in bringing out a lot of these innovations, I always say this, that uh, it's kind of a negative thing, but still India is a graveyard of innovation pilots, right? Everybody has a lot of pilots, nothing ever scales. And that's kind of our big challenge. And one of the biggest issues we face is distribution networks and after-sales service networks. So I can put all these technologies out. They are best in the world, I can assure you. They are medically certified for FDA, everything. But we have no clue how in, I don't know, Moradabad or somewhere, I'm going to service it if it fails, for whatever reason. Maybe the doctor dropped it. We have no idea how to get there, service it, and so on. So then if there's an outbreak of a disease, God help us, right? So the technology will not come to our aid. And that kind of an infrastructure does not exist. And currently we are in the mode of building it step by step. So we are identifying, so we have something called a Bosch certified program. So we are identifying entrepreneurs, we are making them distributors, we are training them. We are one of the biggest vocational training centers in the country that the prime minister recently awarded. So we are literally building it up step by step, but in a private sector kind of a mode. The, the question on are we sometimes at risk of promoting too much expensive infrastructure? Um, I'm wondering if you have a view on that. Um, you know, we've seen a, we, we see several initiatives around smart cities that involve the application of technologies. We've got you know Cisco's work. We have the IBM uh, smart cities program, Siemens. Um, several big companies are seeing a, a, a big opportunity here. How how do you feel this question about the cost of technology, to, uh, not at the individual user level, I'm talking more about when you're trying to engage with installation of large scale systems in a city that maybe lacks some of the fiscal capacity. Does that, is that an issue that you um, come up against at all in your work? So I think the word technology is very wide. Uh, we'll talk about ICT particularly. Uh, because technology, healthcare to, to road construction involves different hues of technology. We find that today for ICT, the average city spend on ICT is about 2% of their total budget, sometimes even lower. And we are asserting that if you went from 2 to 3%, you'll see a dramatic change in the quality of life. But for us, the issue on costs at a consumer level, uh, let's have the audience respond to it. Do you know what is your average spend per user on your cell phone in India? It's roughly 150 rupees per month, which is less than $3. Globally, the average is about $45 a month. So we are almost at the inflection point in terms of how least expensive that can be, that we can be. The issue, however, for us is always capacity on technology. So for instance, we are at Vigyan Bhavan. If you wanted to connect Vigyan Bhavan to, say, Sansad Bhavan through a wired uh, fiber optic cable, the multiplicity of agencies that you would have to coordinate with to dig the road from Vigyan Bhavan through till Sansad Bhavan is a nightmare in terms of capacity. And that nightmarish capacity increases and inflates costs significantly. And hence the bane of India, which is to go, go wireless for everything. Moment you go to wireless, and there are some downsides that come with it, and this is for a more, that's a more different discussion, but uh, we have this issue. So capital is an issue, but is capital the primary issue? Clearly not. It's almost like an existential question, isn't it? So when the internet started in 1995, we were asked this question, can India afford the internet? If you hark back to the budgets of 1980s of how the finance ministers in India presented budgets, India was a reluctant urbanizer. You were always told that if you stayed in the hinterland, you were being true to the cultural ethos and that's what you ought to do and the famous Hindu rate of growth. India urbanized in spite of it. 
technology will penetrate its, itself in spite of policy. The question is, will policy be a catalyst or will it be an inhibitor? Yeah, thank you. Um, Manoj, I know you wanted to have a, a final word on to reflect on some of the questions. And I, I know that there were other hands up, but we have now almost crossed the 12.30 mark. So I'm going to let you have the last word um, and then hand it back to Prashant and thank everyone for their, for their presence and attention. And, um, um, and hopefully this has sparked um, thoughts on you know, the direction of this is a relatively new concept, if you like, for us in India. Um, and, and it's clearly got a lot of different dimensions to it that we need to that we need to sort of organize our thinking around. But let me give you the last word and then ask Prashant to come up and, and close the session. The last positive. Absolutely. Great. Even better. <laughs> no, I, I would just uh, say in closing that uh, the, you know, the kind of spirit of collaboration which is coming up, the kind of uh, base level uh, sort of foundations which are being laid, whether it's infrastructure, health, insurance, financial inclusion services. I mean, I would say that there is no, I mean, I mean, there is no better time to be in India than today. And I, and, and I mean, as a group, as a house, we, we, we remain very optimistic of the future. And I'm sure that uh, with uh, with each each sankalp that we sort of uh, re meet again, I'm sure we, one would be able to track the kind of progress that we make. So, you know. I mean, wish all of us all the best and look forward to better times. Thank you.